Okay, Max, we are out of position here. We got cactus, desert, and rattlesnakes to deal with here. Let's talk about this shot in terms of how you feel a high handicapper should play it, a mid and a low handicapper in terms of strategy and just getting back in to the golf course. Personally, whatever handicap you are, you should be avoiding the snakes. Got I it. Hate snakes. Uh, yeah, so we, we would have three, three options. Um, for a high handicapper, we're just trying to get it back on grass uh, over this uh, little wash. So it would fly about 100 yards, uh, safest possible. Just don't try to be a hero. The mid handicap always has a tougher decision because I think a mid handicap does have a few more, few more shots in their bag. Uh, but again, uh, we still want to get it back in position. We may be able to push it a little bit further up so we could have a shorter third. Um, but at the same time, you know, grasses first. And then the low handicap uh, would be able to get there from here. Uh, they'd have to make a decision of, hey, could I hit a little bit of a cut and get it to the green, um, which I, I would assume most would say yes. Uh, so then it's just kind of trying to, to use that, uh, that low handicap talent and, and, and see what they could do to get it up by the hole. But, uh, you know, typically uh, when you're out of position, you get it back in position as fast as you can. I'm sure you know that better than anybody. Absolutely. Well, we're going to see all three of these shots just a little bit later in the show. We're just getting started with Max Homa on playing lessons. Playing lessons. Presented by Bushnell. We're on a 440 yard par four here, a little wind in here, but there's not a lot for you to worry about. No fairway bunkers, no out of bounds and a pretty wide fairway. Walk us through your process, if you will, in terms of how specific you're gonna be in terms of picking out a target. Oddly enough, as you kind of implied, the, the big fairways, sometimes you make some sloppy swings and it usually starts with not picking a very specific target. Fortunately for me off the tee, I have basically the same shot every time I play a little left to right shot. It just depends if I'm gonna let it go and put it up in the air or if I'm gonna keep it down. So uh, on this one, I'll be able to hit it up in the air a little bit, uh, but I'm gonna have to find, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of cacti out here. So I'll find a cactus, typically probably the left center of this fairway, and then one that matches to the middle. But I'll try to be as disciplined as I can to make sure I'm not just getting up and making a golf swing, that I'm, that I'm trying to hit a shot, kind of match my visual and make it as specific as possible. All right, talk us through this driver, if you will, please. Yeah, uh, there's a greenside bunker up there. There is a bit of a run out down the left. So for me, since I like to move the ball left to right, I can typically cheat a little closer to that left edge line. So I'll move it a little left of that fairway bunker, which would be pretty much five yards from the left rough. And now to me, it feels like I have 35, 40 yards of room to the right, knowing that typically I don't hit it left. I can hold it off and it, to me, it makes the fairway feel quite big. So I'm gonna try to finish it in the, on the right edge of that greenside bunker. So it'll be about like a five to eight yard cut. Little into the wind. So uh, on this one, it shouldn't get to a run out so I can kind of let the thing let it go a little bit. So I pick an intermediary spot in between my ball and the target. So that's what I do here. So I'm picking that right edge of that bunker. Then I kind of get it and just get open to the start line, which is the one I was saying that's five yards inside the left rough. Beautiful. Power cut, left Thank center. You. Thank you. Max, you're a legendary figure on Twitter, and uh, you know, got to really respect the fact that you talk about the highs, you talk about the lows. Talk about that community, if you will, that you have that follows you and supports you the way they do. Is you find it to be somewhat cathartic in terms of you know sharing things with everybody uh, through your Twitter feed. What do you feel like it does for you in terms of your ability to relax and just kind of chill after rounds of tournaments? Yeah, you know. It's a little bit of everything. Obviously, it's amazing when it's going good. After wins or after great finishes, having an enormous support system of mostly people I don't know, <laughs> but just reach out and say such nice things and feel like I have just like a huge family and like, I, I, I guess when you grow up, you, you think about playing golf and here in Cheers and to ever think you're gonna have a fan follow you and play golf is, would be very uh, bizarre. And I like to be able to say I have fans of mine who say that they like, oh, I had so much fun watching you today. We we're rooting for you at home. Like that kind of stuff is so heartwarming. It is tough uh, when it's not going great, not because of the people who are being mean, just like you wanna keep that community having fun. Yeah. And there'll be weeks, you know, I'll be struggling on a, Wednesday afternoon, and they'll be like, oh, Max, I already know you're gonna win, uh, you know, the, the US Open. And you're like, oh, man, I'm 
feel like you're going to be let down. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in general, I think uh, it's been a really great thing for me. I, I, I use Twitter mostly, uh, mostly just to follow sports. Honestly, I keep up with the Dodgers and Lakers, um, some of the golf stuff, like all that. It, it is cathartic. It is, it is a nice hobby at times, I guess you could say. Um, but yeah, having having a huge support. I, I had a bigger support system than I deserved. Uh, for my for my play on the golf course uh, back in the day, so I've just been trying to slowly try to make those level. Right. Well, you're at four wins at the moment, and just just rocketing up in terms of your your play out there and, and your position in the world rankings and things along those lines. But let's talk about that first win at Wells Fargo. You know, it had been somewhat of a struggle for you as you came out of Cal with a lot of expectations. You got some experience and you, you know, certainly got your feet wet out there on the PGA Tour, but tell us about that initial win at Wells Fargo and just what it did for you. And in a sense, you know, did you, do you feel like it kind of came somewhat out of nowhere or were you kind of building as you headed into that week? Definitely didn't come out of nowhere. I was building. Um, I played really well the week prior at the, the team event at the Zurich um, and my game felt awesome. Uh, it just hadn't been clicking at all. And, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of, uh, you know, maybe some scar tissue as to how I've played in the past and maybe not knowing if how good my good golf was, if my good golf was good enough to win on tour. I watch people like your man, Justin Thomas, who I played with in college. And, you know, I used to compete with him and now I see him skyrocketing. And, and I just didn't know if I, if I just, if my game just didn't trans, translate to the PJ tour. So winning that golf tournament, what it really did for me is it showed I didn't actually have to play perfect to win. I put it amazing that week. Uh, it was uh, one of my best putting performances of my life, but at the same time, I didn't hit it perfect. I didn't chip it perfect. I, I left a lot out there, as everyone does every week. So I thought that was what it meant for me the most, was that I could, I could go each week and not feel like I had all this pressure to be perfectly locked in. I can just play a good week of golf, put myself in contention, and then uh, maybe get a W. The trusty laser tells us we got 155 total, 129 front edge. When we factor in all the environmental things here, it's going to play 154 total. Talk to us through this shot here. The wind's actually starting to pick up as we speak. You know, it's a, it's a tough right hole location. The green goes away back there where the hole sits. Talk us through how you're going to factor in, of course, picking the right club. We're at altitude, hurting wind. And, and the fact now that the ball is a few inches below your feet. Yeah, uh, the ball be being below my feet here actually helps. I'm somebody who likes to work the ball from the middle of the green towards the pin. Obviously, this is a pretty tricky one where the miss right would be a pretty tough bunker shot. I'm going to make sure I'm keeping it left of the pin and always kind of falling towards it if I can. So that's why that lie helps quite a bit. With the wind, I'm uh, going to have to play an eight iron. So it's going to be a bit more of a, uh, a touchier shot. So I am going to probably try to land this about 150. I'm going to hit uh, about a 155 shot in my head and start it in the middle of the green. I'm not going to think about cutting it this time uh, just because the lie is going to do it for me. So uh, there's a cactus, shocking, uh, <laughs> right about in the middle of the green. So what I can do again with this lie is I, I can just hit a shot, take it right at that, have the lie kind of have it fall a little bit right for me. And if it doesn't fall, uh, obviously the tricky shot, uh, we'll take 20 feet uh, just left of it. Oh, be right, baby. Good looking line there. And Max, you know, should the flag have been seven on the center here, would that have changed anything that you did in terms of how aggressive you are or how you played the shot? Yeah, working from the pin back, if it feels like it's a great number, I'll be a lot more inclined to be aggressive. Um, but I think that's the beauty of golf. Uh, you're gonna have shots uh, and numbers that just don't fit great and you're gonna have to kind of pull back a little bit. But if this was a perfect, again, if it wasn't windy and this was a perfect nine iron, it would have, I would have been much more inclined to kind of cheat off that uh, cactus a little bit uh, and, and want it to finish right at the pin. That one there uh, finished right at the pin. It was a bit of a block, but that's the, you know, kind of the reason we pick a, a, a target so far left of the pin off of a lie like this. Um, I know it's going to bleed over there, so I'm going to give myself a bit of safety room, a bit of a buffer uh, uh, for a tough pin. But yeah, for an easier pin, one that fits me really well, uh, that's kind of more brainless. You just kind of aim at the pin and, and, and make your normal stock swing. All right, let's go see if we can make a birdie. Let's do it. Time now for Laser Focus, presented by Bushnell. Max, you are famous for roasting people's swings on Twitter. Tell us what you look for in a good swing. You know, you obviously have one of the more incredible swings on the tour, great motion. What is it that you like to see in somebody else's swing or certainly in your own? 
Kind of same for both. Uh, I feel like there's obviously a lot of unique moves on the PGA Tour. You have people with high hands, uh, kind of flat hands, uh, a lot of rotation, not a lot of rotation. The thing I like to see uh, is just kind of face stabilization through impact. So uh, typically not seeing a lot of flip. Uh, I think I bring that up because I'm somebody that's what I work on a lot is trying not to do that. Uh, so when I'm looking at a golf swing, rhythm is usually the first thing that kind of peeks out. Uh, obviously I think it's hard to, you know, it takes a lot of flexibility and practice to do a lot of the things that are done in the backswing. But as far as impact goes and the face stabilization, as I mentioned, uh, someone like Colin Morikawa, he does an amazing job of kind of staying in the golf shot, turning his left hip out of the way, and then just keeping the club face really, really stable. It's really not a surprise when you see the stats every year how good of an iron player he is. And uh, that's one of those things when you watch in slow motion, you think about how you could ever screw that up. <laughs> Great second shot. You got a good looking leave here for birdie. Walk us through your green reading process, if you will, and where does it start? Are you thinking about the read on this putt as you know, we walk onto the green, or do you, you know, get up here and go a little later? Yeah, I actually, uh, I used to, as I'd walk up to the green, I'd try to scope the entire green surface, even like the landscape. Um, but I've been doing aim point for a couple months now, and I actually try to look at it as little as possible to, to f learn it in my feet first without any kind of uh, bias that my eyes have taught me. So typically what I'll do is I'll get in. Um, I do look at the speed, so I'll look, this is uphill a little bit. It kind of goes down past the pin as we were talking about in the fairway. Uh, so it's gonna be mostly uphill. Uh, so I start there and then uh, I kind of come behind it and kind of guess where my line will be. And I just use my feet all, uh, you know, about just past halfway in the line. So to me, this feels like it's gonna go just a little bit left. I like to do it two, two different ways, uh, just because that's how I practice. It's very straight. I'm not feeling a ton, but if anything, I have a little bit of a right to left bias. I usually come back and kind of double check that at least that makes some sense to my eyes. So I come back and it does look, if I had to read this with my eyes, I'd, I'd say it might be straight to left center. So if I'm feeling right to left with my feet a little bit and I'm seeing a little left to right, uh, I'd probably play this about straight, maybe just right to center, trusting my feet a little bit more. Uh, then when I'm coming in, uh, this is the only weird part about, not probably only, but weird part about my putting is sometimes I use the line and sometimes I don't. When a putt's quite straight like this, I do like to use the line. Um, speed just feels like it's a much bigger factor when it comes to uh, big breaking putts. And when you don't use a line, or at least for myself, um, it just seems to open up my feel and make me be a little bit more reactive and more like an athlete. So I get the line kind of situated and then pretty much it's try to turn my brain off as much as possible and use my eyes as best I can. So I'll walk into the putt like this. I'll get into my, my setup. Um, I'll take a peek or two at the hole. And when I do that, I feel like you're just trying to connect with what you're trying to do. I don't think you're overthinking it too much. You're just trying to connect and build that, that feel uh, kind of brain to hands. So I get, uh, I get comfy here. And then the only thing I ever really think about with my putting would be just rhythm, kind of just like my, my golf swing, just trying to have a nice, uh, a confident stroke, but not, not one that gets too quick. Count it. Beautiful. Nice birdie. So nerves. you mentioned aim point. Yeah. But what's interesting to me is in my experience with the folks that teach that, they refuse to believe there's anything called a valley effect. Yet you play at a golf club here where all the local caddies swear by it. What do you got for us? Are you a valley effect guy when you play up here or no? Yes, if you're using your eyes. But what's funny is ever since I've learned it, coming to a golf course that is predominantly uh, has a conversation about the valley effect, you feel that in your feet. You just can't see it. Uh, it it's like when you're reading a putt, uh, there's a hole in my home golf course I grew up at uh, in Valencia, Valencia Country Club. And uh, there was a hole that when you read a putt, it looked dead flat as far as the speed went. And everyone blew it by. And if you just look to the left, the five freeway that goes all the way up California is pointed like this. But we feel always like we're standing on a flat surface. So when, uh, as, as our eyes would tell us. But if you just look to the horizon, you notice that you're a little bit tweaked. So for here, I, that's why I try not to look too much. Because if I looked at this putt, I would not think that there could be there, there could be there could be a valley effect. Um, of course, your eyes don't know that. But when I get in and feel my feet, I'm like, oh, that's quite odd. And if you were ever to put a level down on a putt that you think's flat, and all of a sudden you see that it's actually quite a bit breaking to the right, uh, and you think, oh man, you know, I have heard that there's a valley effect. Everything for us breaks down towards, uh, you know, the Capitol Grill, as I say, down on the corner by TPC. And it's like, oh well, that makes a lot more sense why I miss those putts. But when I get use my feet and my feel, it, that that effect goes out the window for me. I think you got a free meal coming up at Capitol Grill. <laughs> <laughs> well played.
Okay, Max, we've driven it out of position here on this par five. We need to get back into play. Let's talk about it from all three angles, high handicap, mid handicap, and low handicap. And for those high handicap friends, they've got to deal with 85 yards of desert here in front of them, then a 101 total to get back to the fairway through the wash. What would you recommend they do? Uh, we're going grass first. Get it over the wash, put it on grass, get yourself a, a, a fairly easy third shot. Um, so if it's 101 to the fairway, I would try to hit something 105, 110 yards, something safe for me. It's gonna be my uh, sand wedge, uh, but for every, anybody uh, hitting this shot, it's just whatever gets you that number. Uh, we're trying to take this tree out of play. We're just trying to get it back over the desert uh, onto grass. Give yourself at least opportunity to hit that green uh, for your third shot. Safety first in this instance. All right, perfectly done. And we are back on the golf course. And for those mid handicap players that you talked about earlier that sometimes would want to take on just a little bit more risk, what do you feel like they should do? Certainly they wouldn't have trouble getting the ball back into the fairway, but there's a fairway bunker out there some 183 yards. Would you recommend they push the ball up in an attempt to make birdie or keep the ball back to take the sand out of play? Yeah, uh, something I hear a lot is uh, hit it to a number you love. Um, if you're a mid handicap player, you don't get enough time to practice. I don't know if there's a number that you truly love. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger version of the high handicap remove. We want this thing on grass. We could push it a little bit further just because of the uh, ability level a little bit more. So we can push a little bit further, but we're gonna take that bunker out of play. We're going to hit this third shot from the fairway uh, and, and avoid the desert, avoid the sand. So I would would say if it's 183 to that bunker I'm picking a number that does not get to that so I'm gonna hit a hit a club that goes just shy of that for me it's gonna be an eight iron uh, and yeah so we'll be a little bit closer than than obviously hitting uh, the first layup but this one we're, we're, we're still same idea it's take all the trouble out of play that you can got it all right another beautiful swing safe also back in play Let's just talk about goals. You know, top tens and majors now, things along those lines. Of course, everything building, building to, to bigger and better things. You know, what ahead of you do you really want to accomplish? What do you see coming down the road for Max here shortly? The immediate for me, um, it, I've, I've, the President's Cup's been the only thing I've been thinking about since last year's, uh, not playing the Ryder Cup last year, getting to watch everybody play in that. And knowing I had, you know, an outside chance to make that team. So the President's Cup and then uh, my goal, uh, I always thought being top 10 in the world would be amazing. Uh, I hope to get there and then hopefully the next goal would be number one. But uh, at the moment, kind of knocking on that door a little bit. It's, it's been a fun year. It's been the, the first year where I feel like I've had sustained great golf. Uh, I've had spurts, which has been good. Uh, you know, you see spurts and know that you could hang on to it, but this has been the first year where it's been sustained and where those goals that, that, I've, that are lofty, in my opinion, to where I, I have been in the past, um, that's where they started to make me feel like okay this is reasonable and if I keep doing what I'm doing it's it's kind of addicting to go practice when you know you're getting close uh, and I think that's been quite fun for me um, I could say you know at the beginning of the year I want to play better in the majors uh, and it's tough that you get four of them a year it's that's a almost an unfair thing to say I want to uh, if I don't win a major this year it's a failure of a season for me um, you know maybe if I ever were to win one maybe that becomes the main goals but uh, for me right now uh, like I said President's Cup and all that comes with with good play and in, in the big events and in the majors so um, yeah slowly but surely just chipping away at it we've got some kind of tree in front of us the low handicappers may be thinking about trying to knock it on here from some 254 of the flag what would you recommend they do and let's talk about shot shape and ultimately how you do it yeah so this is I would say my more my expertise. I consider myself a low handicap, uh, not a tree expert as you. But um, I, you know, this is going to be tricky. We have we have a couple issues in front of us. We have a uh, a lie that's not in the fairway. Uh, we have a long way in, uh, and we have a bit of uh, a bit a bit of tree trouble. So we're going to have to curve the golf ball. Uh, I would assume the low handicap can hit a draw and a cut. We're going to need a cut here. Uh, but yeah, if we're going to take it on, uh, we're going to pick a club that. As my you know, brilliant caddy Joe always says, if we're gonna take on the shot, we need to at least give ourselves, know that if we hit a great one, we're gonna have a putt for eagle. So we're gonna take a club that gets there, so it's gonna be a seven wood uh, for me. Something, uh, again, if we have 250, that's, that's the number we're trying to get this to, if we're gonna try to be the hero. Bit awkward, obviously, we're gonna have to aim it left and, and, and slice it up, uh, up towards the green a bit. Um, so if we're gonna try to do that, we are still trying to take the trouble out of play, which is why we're gonna curve it a lot, but uh, this is a bit of a risk, obviously.
All right, cutting. Maybe just Actually, a little bit decent. right of the green. Quite decent. Yeah, let's talk about a couple of things here. To basically, to, to hit that cut that you need to get around the vegetation, how do you go about doing it? I set up uh, my club face towards where I want the ball to finish, and I set up my body, feet, and everything else to where I want to start it. So for me, that was quite a bit left, 20, 20 30 yards left. Um, and then put the ball up in my stance, that helps the ball cut and start left, which is, a, you know, an important part of a cut. If it starts right and cuts, it's gonna miss way, way right. Uh, so little setup things. For me, I don't change too much in my actual golf swing. Uh, it all starts before I hit the golf ball. Okay, I have you down as being one of the 10 best players in the world. And whether we're talking high, mid, or low handicappers, you have a seven wood in your bag. I recently caddied a major, and there was a guy in our group with a nine wood in his bag. Tell our friends at home what these clubs can do for players at your level and theirs. It's the new wave. Uh, take the ego out of play. I don't know where it became egotistical to uh, have to hit a three iron or a two iron, but uh, somewhere along my path through college, I thought that I was quote unquote good enough to not need one of these. Uh, and yeah, I played with, uh, I played with some guys who were using seven woods and nine woods at the, uh, at the PJ championship a few years ago. And uh, obviously I got quite curious uh, and it didn't take long for me to realize why they had it. It was much better out of the rough. It was more versatile. Uh, and honestly for par fives, this has been our favorite club. Uh, it is, uh, has the ability to hit it quite high. Uh, it's easy to control. It honestly sometimes feels like I'm hitting a pitching wedge. So uh, yeah, no, no shame in the wood game, I guess, these days. There you have it, folks. Seven and nine woods are in. I have pretty much two shots, maybe three shots I'll ever hit with a driver, and they all have the same type of flight. To kill a bit of distance here, I would try to you know, tee it up maybe a little lower and try to think about hitting a little bit lower in general, the ball flight. 